You are listening to Lions Unchained. The podcast where the lion within you is unleashed and the truth will set you free. Join Carl Joseph right now for a life-changing word where no topic is off the table. Get ready to be unleashed into your destiny. Well, you know what the Bible says, don't you? Well, what's that? That all things work together for good, or at least that's what someone told me the Bible says. Well, friend, I've been witness, unfortunately, down the years, especially at funerals, to some of the most bizarrely unscriptural consolations offered to the grieving families of those who've died tragically in some accident or other. Let me paraphrase what some ministers have said. Well, we don't really know why Uncle Bob and Aunt Sue and their three kids died in the car wreck, but we know that God has a plan, and the Bible does say God works in mysterious ways. Perhaps God needed some more angels in heaven, so we'll never quite know why he sent them home so soon. Friend, this is nothing but religious drivel, and I know that sounds harsh, but think about it for a moment. What a bizarre and needlessly discompassionate statement to make. Sometimes ministers would offer a consolation by sharing this scripture, Romans 8.28, that all things work together for good. So they needn't worry because God has a plan in the big scheme of things. Now let me park the bus right here and right now by saying that God is not the author of death and in this dispensation of grace, better known as the church age, he is not a killer. No friend, Hebrews 2.14 makes it plain that the devil has the power of death, not God. In Acts 17 verses 25 through 28 and 1 Timothy 6.13, it clearly states that God is both the author and sustainer of life, not death. For him to be party to killing folk, or especially children, in accidents would be in complete contradiction to his loving nature as expressed in his holy word. Jesus also stated in John's Gospel, the 10th chapter, that it is the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came that we might have life and more abundantly. So friend, let's not get them mixed up. The passage in question that I'm talking about today is namely Romans 8.28, and the focus of our discussion. It says all things work together for good. But if we read this passage in its proper context, it's talking about prayer and specifically praying in the Spirit. The context of all things working together for good can only be attained if certain prerequisites are met and these are laid down clearly within the text. The incorrect hermeneutic of taking simply one passage and making a doctrine out of it is clearly implausible and downright misleading. The Bible says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established, and that's the same when establishing doctrine in God's word. We need several scriptures to clearly establish orthodox doctrine. God plays no part in tragic events that end in death, trauma, or destruction, though he is ever ready to assist us or deliver us from them at any stage should we seek him. Even though some might quip God works in, quote, mysterious ways, he never sanctions or authors evil for his own benefit or his children's. But evil is unfortunately an inherent part of this world until Christ returns to set up his kingdom. Evidence of this is found in 1 John 5.19, where it says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We should also realize that we can gain a better understanding of God's ways by reading his word particularly. Consequently, his ways will not be so mysterious to us after all. A cursory knowledge of the Bible reveals that God never sides with evil to produce his desired outcome, but there are certainly bad consequences for some people's decisions in this life. People have unfortunately been severely and emotionally traumatized and their trust in God shattered by religious quips at funerals which literally make God out to be a murderer. Statements like these are a gross affront to God's character, integrity and nature and display nothing but the ignorance of the minister who espoused it. God gets blamed for so many things in this world that he has nothing to do with whatsoever. The devil also gets far too much credit for things that should have been resolved with things like diligence or checking car brakes or tire pressures or following safety codes or taking fire precautions, etc. Tire blowouts are not always the work of the devil, but running them too low is often the cause for blowouts. 
Now, I'm not discounting the numerous machinations of Satan and his minions which can do bizarre things on occasion. But our general attitude, however, in daily living should be one of diligence, which is a key component of successful living and spoken of extensively in the book of Proverbs. We live in a cursed and sinful world, my friend. We have also been redeemed from the curse of the law by Christ Jesus, which is poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. But we have not been redeemed from the curses in the earth. And as a result, this creation is prone to accidents from time to time, as the Bible states. If a God who warns his people not to do evil or succumb to its temptation, then utilizes that same evil for his own means, then he has become the ultimate hypocrite. It's most assuredly not God's will that any Christians suffer these tragic events if they're listening to the Holy Spirit and his warnings. But if they do occur, these events are definitely not working together for good, as some claim, when we consider the aftermath of both the physical and psychological suffering inflicted upon the victims and their families. The loss of an entire family in a traffic accident is just awful and possibly could have been avoided through safety precautions, but not necessarily. If it occurs, we can't blame God for it or posit it that it's all a part of his mysterious plan. Some Christian leaders have succumbed to cowardice and given in to religious excuses in public forums to obfuscate the real cause of tragic fatalities to people within their congregation. These accidents are a manifestation of the cursed earth in which we live, Genesis 3.17, Genesis 8.21, as evidenced by the fall of the Tower of Siloam, in which 18 people died, or witchcraft that empowered the demonic realm when Pilate mingled blood in sacrifices and caused the death of the Galileans. Proper maintenance of machinery can also assist in avoiding accidents that lead to tragedy and mitigate the curses in the earth. These topics are covered in the first part of Luke chapter 13, and I would urge you, friend, to read these accounts for yourself. Christ offered no special insight into these tragedies or claimed they were part of God's mysterious plan. Now let's read the passage in question that is in our study today. And I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible from Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 30. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we have seen, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren." As with all good examples of exegesis, the answer to this puzzle of biblical interpretation of what precisely causes all things to work together for good is found in the context of the scripture. The verse Romans 8.28 is talking about prayer and no other topic. Verse 26 begins with the fact that we don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit does, and he assists us in praying or supplicating on our behalf as we pray in tandem with him. The onus, therefore, is on us to pray, and he provides the words, but if we don't pray, then he is unable to assist us. The Greek word for intercession means to plead on behalf of one another or act as a mediator or personally make petition. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is asking the Romans to pray in the Spirit potentially for three groups. Number one, for themselves. Number two, for other Christians. And number three, for non-Christians. The Spirit is groaning on our behalf and provides utterance for us. But we must utter what he provides or it is no prayer at all. The Spirit is pleading on our behalf or someone else's according to God's will when we pray. Only when this has been accomplished do all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now the Greek word infirmity does not mean sickness in this passage in verse 26, but it can mean sickness in some rare instances of scripture elsewhere. 
Its purest definition, however, is weakness, and that is how it is translated in the Amplified, in the Complete Jewish Bible, and the NASB. It can also mean impotent, which means lacking in strength, vigor, or power. On a simplistic level, sick people go to an infirmary to be lodged and treated, not an infirmity. Infirmity means weakness or inability to gain success in the modern vernacular. The same root word is used in Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 1 and describes a stumbling block, which would be an obstacle to progress or an impediment to believe or understanding. In a nutshell, the Holy Spirit basically helps us overcome our obstacles to progress in our Christian walk and any hindrances to our understanding about a situation when we pray in the Holy Spirit. The point being is we don't know how we should pray about certain situations, but when we pray in the Spirit, God helps our inabilities and weaknesses. Praise God for such an awesome gift as praying in the Spirit. Looking at the word structure of this passage, the conjunction and in verses 27 and 28 joins all these sentences together. So it's a continual flow of narrative. So both verses 27 and 28 follow on from what is said in verse 26. Praying in the Spirit helps our infirmities. It helps our inability to gain success. And by praying this way, we're praying the perfect will of God in our lives. Only then, once these conditions have been met, can God cause all things to work together for good. Accidents, terminal disease, and sudden death are not spoken of in this passage, nor are they labeled good anywhere in the Bible, no matter how mysterious or synchronistic they might appear to us. These verses start out by discussing praying in the Spirit and have nothing to do with car accidents or sudden deaths that some suggest is God working mysteriously behind the scenes. Friend, all things do not come from God. The scripture simply states that if we pray in the Spirit, we know for sure that we're praying the perfect will of God for ourselves or others. And if we love God, and if we're called according to His purpose, then will all things work together for good. Friend, we have to take the context of any passage of Scripture. We simply cannot take something away from what it does not say. We need to read several verses prior and several verses following the verse in question. Christianity is not like Islam, where they believe all is as God wills it. No, this is a fatalistic view. All things do work together for good, but only precisely as God's word describes it will, and no other way. Friend, this topic has caused so much wounding down the years, I felt compelled to discuss it. Because there are so many things that God is getting the blame for that he has nothing to do with. We have to search the scriptures out for ourselves and find the hidden nuggets of God's word so we can see his glorious nature for ourselves. Good night, God bless, and remember to spread the good news. You have been listening to Carl Joseph in the Lions Unchained podcast. Every week, new episodes are uploaded. So stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out our website at carljosephministries.com for exciting articles and discussion points. See you next week. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button.